Welcome back. It is demo time, as I promised. For the next 45 minutes, we will divide the time between Ignacy Barrera, founding engineer at Tetrate, and our NIST colleague, Joshua Roberts. I can confess I have not seen Ignacy's demo, so I'm super interested and eager to see it. It's done so interesting, you know, service mesh as the security kernel for ZTA. But I am familiar with Blossom or a blockchain-based secure software asset management pilot because I lead this effort and Josh did a great job implementing NGAC, which you'll learn of many times during the past two days into the smart contracts for Hyperledger Fabric 2.2 in support of our proposed assessment management, assets management solutions, I apologize. So, you learned from Zach of NGAC yesterday during service match in, uh, when it was um, uh, in the training session provided yesterday. With that, I would like to invite you to the two demos that are following as a bundle. And I think that Ignacy will get the microphone first. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me share the screen and make sure that you can all see, right? If you cannot see my screen, please let me know. So we have seen before in Zach's talk um, why a, uh, a service mesh can be a security kernel for a zero trust architecture platform. And we have seen in Kelsey's talk, some of the primitives and the principles that the service mesh leverages like the runtime identity, how you can play with them the hard way, right? So in this demo, we'll see that, how you can do that the easy way by using Istio and some of the open source projects that exist today. And we will see how we can leverage several of the features of a service mesh to implement some of the primitives that you need for zero trust platforms, right? So one of the main ideas of a service mesh is that you have these Envoy proxies, these layer seven proxies, uh, and this sidecar pattern where you deploy a proxy beside each workload, right? So proxies are intercepting all the traffic coming and going, and they can act as a policy enforcement point. So we will see how we can leverage those to do several types of policy enforcement, such as user identity and user identity enforcement, runtime identity to enforce service to service uh, communications, and also how we can do targeted application policies um, to, to understand how we can just roll out functionality to the Envoys just for a subset of applications, for example, to mitigate some security breaches and stuff like that, right? So first of all, I have deployed in here, we have an example application that is deployed, uh, which is this one, that is a simple web application written in Java that is just printing this message, welcome to any user that has been logged in. It is inspecting the HTTP request to find the token with information about the user. And if not, it's just printing anonymous, right? So this is a Java application that has no notion of security and no notion of anything, but as any application that is running in our infrastructure, we would like it to have a, every single request properly authenticated and users to have been already logged in in our identity provider, right? If you have just one application that is easy, but if you have a bunch of them, it is a pain to upgrade all of them, right? And so the service mesh helps us just offload that to the platform and make it a platform concern. Right? So we have a service mesh here that I have already configured uh, to use Auth0 as the, as the identity provider, uh, for example, purposes, and it is configured you can see here, this is the YDC configuration that I have applied in the service mesh, right? It is not part of the application. This application has nothing, but I have a service running in the service mesh that is configured to make sure that all services will, will have a YDC. And we can tell the mesh to apply this policy and automatically enforce it so that all the workloads get, get it, right? So for example, this is how a policy would look like in a service mesh. Hopefully you can read it. It has three main parts, a policy in this case in the Istio service mesh. It has a selector part, well, it has a name, 
and it has a selector part where you can tell the mesh where this policy needs to be applied. One of the main features that you get with a service mesh is that you have centralized control so that you apply policies in a central place and the mesh takes care of distributing the policy to all the sidecar proxies, to all the envoys that need to have that policy and to enforce it, right? So we have a selector where we can say where the policy must go. In this case, I will be applying it to the ingress gateway, uh, but this is not a zero trust, right? So in zero trust, we say that policies must be enforced at the workload level, not, not only on the ingress, not only on the perimeter, but just for the demo purposes and to see why it is important that this is not done this way, I'm gonna apply it to the ingress gateway. Then we have usually an action that can be allow or deny to do to accept the request or reject it, or we have this custom thing which will just delegate the access decision to someone else. Right? And this is an important distinction because we have these sidecar proxies acting as the PEP, as the policy enforcement point, but that doesn't mean that the decision has to be made by the sidecar itself, right? So this properly decouples the concept of the PEP, the policy enforcement point, and the PDP, the policy decision point. So you can instruct your sidecar proxy to ask for a decision from someone else. In this case, there is this service that is the one that is responsible to, of enforcing that all the requests are authenticated against the identity provider. And finally, you have a, where the policy applies to, which is to every single request. So if we apply this policy in our cluster that is not applied yet, now, this policy will target the ingress gateway where this application in ex is exposed. And if I refresh the page, I will no longer be able to, to just uh, log in without providing credentials, right? So you see that now I am redirected automatically to my identity provider to authenticate, right? I can authenticate. And then I can access the application again, right? So and it is printing my username, welcome Ignasi. It's printing some information that is contained in the token that has been issued by the entity provider. And it is just printing the, the raw job token that the identity provider has issued for me, right? So with no changes to the application code, we have been able to protect access to the application and make sure that all the users are properly logged in in the identity provider, right? And usually when you integrate with OpenID Connect and stuff, you need to implement some stuff in your application like implementing some callbacks when the when the request goes to the entity provider then back to the application so we have not needed to do anything like this because we have this service that uh, and the mesh that is dealing with that complexity for us but as we have seen we are applying this application this policy at the ingress level which is not good which is not what we want to do in a zero trust architecture platform because that means that everyone within the perimeter which is what we want to eliminate uh, can just bypass this policy and access directly my workload, right? So, for example, let me deploy a service that is will just expose a, a shell in the cluster. From within the cluster, I can access this application that is called vulnerable. We will see that later. I can just do a curl to the internal service name of the application within the cluster. And I get the same result that I was getting before, right? Because this policy is only enforced in the ingress at, at the, say, at the API gateway or whatever. And this is not what we want to do. Right? So how we can fix this? There is one obvious way, which is just changing this. And instead of applying it to the ingress gateway, let's apply it to the, to the cycle of the application so that all the traffic, no matter where it comes from, is going to enforce that, the, that this uh, request has went through the identity provider, right? Or we could do something else. I want to show you how we can enforce policies based on the runtime identity. The same, kind of similar to an example that Kelsey showed when the, he was using these Spiffy identities and Aspire, EST also uses this notion of the Spiffy identities. Um, and in this service mesh, every single workload that is deployed in here has its own identity that has been issued by the mesh. We could create a policy, for example, that tells forces all the requests to this application to come from the ingress gateway and to not allow any direct access to the application, right? Like, for example, preventing east-west traffic to this application and forcing all the traffic that goes to the ingress. So we can 
just use a policy like this one here. And you can see that it has the, the same shape as the previous one. It has a name, it has a selector. This time we will be applying it directly to the application, to the application sidecar, because we want the policy to be enforced there. That's the right thing. And it has a pol an action of allowing. So any request that matches this set of rules will be allowed. And in the rules, we are requiring this principle in here. So this string that you see is the spiffy identity that has been issued to my ingress gateway, right? So all the communications, all the workloads that participate in the mesh, including the ingress and ingress gateways, get an identity. And by using this policy, I can say that only traffic that comes from this peer is allowed to reach my application, right? So when a request comes in and we have this mutual TLS environment, when the someone wants to connect to my vulnerable application, it will present a client certificate, the application will present the server side certificate, and those certificates contain this identity, right? And this identity will be verified against this rule, and only the selected ones will be able to just uh, go in. So if we apply this policy, the runtime policy again, now the application sidecar has been instructed to only allow traffic that comes from this service, right? So I can still refresh the page and be accessing the application in here, but if I just do the same thing as I did before, try to access the application from within the cluster, not going via the ingress gateway, but accessing it directly, I get this RBAC access denied and I cannot access anymore the application directly from within the cluster. Right. So by doing no changes to the application code, now we have achieved first making sure that all user access to the application is properly logged in in the, in the identity provider and that only the right services can access the application. Right. For demo purposes, I said there's the ingress, but you could configure only um, that the right service to service communication can happen by leveraging these mesh identities. And you could further extend this policy, not only to the mesh identities, for example, you could extend this policy apart from the source by adding additional constraints that are based on the claims in the job token. I could say only members of the engineering group can access this application and we could do further enforcement based on the user identity. We can combine both the service identity, the runtime identity and the user identity. But for zero trust, architecture platforms, this may not be enough, right? So we now have moved some of these controls to the application, to the sidecar that is there in the workload, but just having this kind of enforcement may not be enough. And the, in this example, we have this application that I said that it's vulnerable. This is an application that is written in Java and it is unfortunately using an, an old version of log for Java for logging messages. Right? We have all heard about this lock for shell attack that kind of uh, everyone would praise about because it was uh, kind of an impactful vulnerability. And this application is uh, subject to that vulnerability, right? And let's see what that means. For example, this application is just printing some logs of the user that has logged in the application. If we look at those, uh, for example, if you look at the logs of this application, we see that this is what it's printing, right? It is printing the user that has logged in and it is printing the token, the payload of this token. It is printing it, it's the decoding in and this is the user that logged in, right? The problem is that it is printing this using this vulnerable log4j version and it is not sanitizing the input so it may be subject to some attacks. What if a malicious user puts some value in any claim, right, that could exploit this vulnerability? For example, me as a user, and this is what you're seeing here is the identity provider, this Auth0, my user profile. I'm not a privileged user, but I can edit my own profile. So I can edit my display name, right? So I could go here and just copy a malicious string specifically crafted, right, and just edit my profile name because I can, I can edit my profile, save it, and just 
log in again to get a new token. Let me log out. And when logging again, apparently nothing happens, right? I just say welcome. I see this kind of weird string here, which is the malicious payload that I set in my own profile display name. But see what happens to the application uh, and to those logs lines that were there, right? So we can see that what happened there, right? So we see, let me just do this again. Let me just refresh to see the proper output. So we can see that there is a dump in here of something that we did not see before, right? And we see this thing like executing cat STC password, and we have a dump of all the users that are in, are in this machine, right? So just me editing my own profile, I achieved, I, I was able to just run a remote execution vulnerability in this vulnerable Java application, right? And this is quite bad, right? This is just printing the users, but this could be doing anything, right? And I'm just exploding this vulnerability being a completely unprivileged user just by editing some random fields in my profile that are not sanitized. So how can we, how can a service mesh achieve, uh, help us protect from this kind of stuff, right? So one of the newest features in Envoy is the extensibility mechanism that it has based on WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is a technology that, that allows you to run code that is compiled to a kind of an assembly language with this just a small set of instructions that are very simple. And the good thing is that since it's quite simple, all these modern compilers, Go, Rust, or C++, you can just compile it to WebAssembly. Envoy has, and Tetris has pushed forward the community a lot to make this happen in Envoy. Envoy has this new mechanism of extending its features by allowing you to run WASM programs inside the Envoy, right? And the, the good thing of WebAssembly is that it runs in a, in a WASM VM completely isolated from the Envoy host process. So it is safe to run it. Whatever WASM program you run in Envoy will not compromise the host process, but you can run anything, right? You have the flexibility of your language of choice to write this one program to extend the functionality of Envoy. So let's see how we can leverage that to kind of mitigate this patch, right? So I have, a, this is a Java application. I'm gonna write a patch in Go, for example, and we can see this is a Go program that we could compile to WebAssembly. And basically it has some initialization steps, initializing a plugin and initializing an HTTP context. And there we have, this uh, on HTTP header request method that is doing something, right? So it is reading information from the token claims. It is getting the name claim in the token if it's present. And if it contains this malicious JNDA string, which is known to trigger this WAPRG attack, it will reject the request, right? Otherwise it will allow it. So for example, and we could even just modify this and, and, and add some logs, um, for example, uh, enforcing WebAssembly at conference, and we could save it. And now we can compile this thing. It's a small Go program. We'll just compile into this WebAssembly target, which is a, a WASM binary. And now we can package this binary to distribute it to the envoys in our service mesh, right? The way it is packaged, in the case of Istio, you can leverage, you can just inject a file directly, this .wasm file, or you can package this into a container, uh, which is a kind of a standard way today of packaging applications, it is well known. You can package it in an OCI container, so an Istio will take care of pulling that container, extracting the WASM file from inside and serving it to Envoy so it can use it. So now we have this compiled, we will be building this thing, this WASM file into a Docker container, and now we will push it to the Docker registry. So now I have just created a custom program in Go using my own language 
having all the versatility that this provides, right? I could be doing everything. I could be doing encryption, decryption, whatever, right? And now I have uploaded it. So now there is this WASM policy that I have in here. This is how you apply WebAssembly plugins in Istio, right? So you have this WASM plugin, same as before, you have a set of selectors. And in this case, I want to target all the Java applications, not just one, right? I want to patch all the Java applications at once. And I want this patch to only target the Java applications. I can do that. And then I just provide the URL of the container that contains this WASM plugin that I just pushed, which is this one, the, the one that I just pushed to my registry. So if I apply this to the cluster, now, the sidecar of this vulnerable application will be enforcing this, this, this WebAssembly policy. So if you go refresh the page, I get this access denied here, which is basically the text that we are setting here, how we are rejecting the request with this 403, which is access denied message. Right? So this is executing my WASM program, the Envoy sidecar. Right? So if we look at the button here and we look at the logs of this vulnerable application, we can just get the logs of the sidecar proxy. Just grab for WebAssembly. Right. We can see here in the logs that we are doing this access the night four, and we can see that it is emitting the log that we just pushed, right? So enforcing WASM from uh, at NIST conf, right? So this is the plugin that we just created, that we just uploaded, that is being executed by Envoy to enforce policy. If I go back and just back to normal user, remove this from my profile, and I log out and log in again just to get a new token. I can log in again, right? So, and I have this WASM plugin also running, but it will not find this string and it will allow me to, to access the application, right? So this provides a lot of flexibility when writing policy because you can use your own language. You're not constrained to the language of, to your policy language or, or anything else, right? And, and this is important because sometimes you cannot wait for a patch. So, probably your firewall or your web application firewall rule set cannot support doing the complex logic that you need to do to mitigate some CVE and there is not a patch ready. Or your API gateway is not powerful enough to allow you to customize some rules that will really mitigate uh, this vulnerability. So you can just write a quick and dirty patch to fix the thing so you're secure and you can mitigate the thing until you are ready to patch everything because the, the patch has already been published and so on, right? So with this, um, I will, I don't know if there are any questions or I will leave it to Josh. Just let me mention that uh, if you want to play with this demo, there is a, this GitHub repository is public. So uh, you can go there, try it, check it out, modify it, play with it. And, and yeah, and just experiment this, the, how powerful it is now uh, to, create custom policies in, in a service mesh. Yeah. Awesome, thank you, Ignasi. Um, yeah, I think we're out of time for questions, but there are quite a few. Um, so if you could stick around and answer as many as you could. Yeah, sure, I will go through them in the chat, yeah. Awesome. Okay, so let me transition from Q&A mode to presenter mode.